10 p.m. here in Accra, 11 p.m. in Abuja, Nigeria, and already midnight in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome to the late news on TV3. My name is Grace Hamwa Asare. Tonight, police arrest key suspects in the killing of two officers at Goma Bujumburam. We will be bringing you more on that particular issue but the bulletin is live on your dstv channel 279 and our live stream on facebook and on 3news.com send your comments to our various social media platforms and they will be read live here first let me run you by the highlights for the day In the highlights tonight, former Minister for Energy and Petroleum Emmanuel Amakofibwa has won a fiercely contested primaries in the Ilembele constituency. He beat his closest rival to retain his slot as parliamentary candidate for the NDC. Meanwhile, there's seeming tension within the National Democratic Congress in the Futu constituency in the central region as some members have petitioned leadership to pursue former NPP member Dr. James Kofi Annan to lead the party as member of parliament. Let's go on the international front and demonstrations have been taking place across the UK against Boris Johnson's decision to suspend Parliament in the run-up to Brexit. Thousands of protesters took to the streets in cities including Manchester, Leeds, York and Belfast. Parts of central London were brought to a standstill as people chanted, Boris Johnson, shame on you. Let's now do the big one. In the big one tonight, the prime suspect in the murder of two MTTD police officers near the Liberia camp on the Accra Cape Coast Highway on Wednesday, August 28, has been arrested. Eric Kojodia was arrested Saturday morning by the police on his way to the Volta region. The prime suspect in the cops' murder was arrested on the Atimpoku Bridge in a black golf car with registration number DW5972-18. The police administration declared the suspect wanted and placed a 10,000 cities bounty on his head. A statement signed by Director General of Police, Public Affairs Department, SCP David Senanu Eklu, said Eric was arrested in an operation led by the National Operations Department from the police headquarters. The police have been on the heels of Eric Kojodia since Wednesday after arresting three of his accomplices in connection with the crime at Kaswa. Two officers of the Motor Transport and Traffic Department, Sergeant Michael Jamesi and Lance Kapro Mohamed Awal, were killed while on operational duties. Some people continue to consider the police as an enemy. That should not have been the case in the first place. Every good citizen should know that the police are there to protect the nation. Therefore, the thought of pulling a gun on a policeman shouldn't exist in the first place. I can assure you that we shall flash out those behind these crimes through all means possible so that the police can be free to protect the citizenry. A fresh video of the suspect Eric Kojodia in police custody has emerged as he was speaking about his intention to slip into Togo to avoid arrest and prosecution for the heinous crime of murder. He also insisted he did not pass through any checkpoint before reaching the point he was arrested. No, no I didn't what pass any barrier. No, I was huh? No, the place I was at my grandma. There's only place that inside when you said, Udi Mania, Udi Mwana. No, yes, sir, but. I never had it. I had it open there. No, no. I would be the castle or the new call, new bra, new one. So that. No, no, no. Charlie, Charlie. I'll report. So Adib Sani is a security analyst and executive director of the Jatke Center for Human Development and Peace Building and joins me in the studio. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So the police within 72 hours have arrested the prime suspect in this case. What does this mean for policing in the country? Well, it means they can be proactive when they want to. Um, the sense of urgency they attach to this is most commendable. Um, I received the news with uh, elation. However, I'm 
hoping that going forward they attach the same deal of importance they attach this issue if it involves civilians and not uh, police officers but that notwithstanding i think is a good thing uh, because it sends a clear signal to whoever is out there and thinking of killing an officer or killing any Ghanaian that we're not in a jungle. Uh, we are a country that is governed by the rule of law and the laws will surely catch up with you no matter how long it takes. You earlier stated that people of this sort should be given the death penalty. Jesus and my... Yes, because, I mean, the, the killing of cops is becoming one too many. Um, criminals have become so emboldened, they've become so brazen in the manner in which they stage their attacks to the extent that they can even attack police officers in broad daylight. A clear signal would also have to be sent, at least to deter them from, you know, towing the same line. And I'm saying emphatically that, look, the legal uh, uh, regime would have to change, so mm. killing an officer would be tantamount to crime against the state, mm. which invariably attracts the death penalty. Mm. So we should go ahead and, and do it? Absolutely. I know uh, full well that uh, Ghana hasn't really implemented that for the past three, four decades, yeah. but uh, I think desperate times calls for desperate measures, and I think that is the way to go. Okay, so I'll have you hold you on. We'll hear and um, we'll listen to Director General of the Police Public Affairs Director. Directorate ACP David Senanua Clue, who is saying the Police Management Board will from next week meet to determine how to implement a directive from the Interior Minister for Personnel of the MTTD to be armed. In a related development, the former Director General of the Police CID COP, retired Bright Odro, wants the police to be vigilant whilst on duty. Yes, in the ACP. Is it normal if we take the Kaswa incident? I, I cannot recall it maybe when an MTU officer was shot at in doing his work. And traditionally, MTU officers or traffic officers, police officers all over the world are not armed. Uh -huh. uh, but the, the Kasua case has given us an education okay. that we need to review right. what we are doing and maybe step up the protection for officers performing traffic duties. So the modalities will be worked out. Yeah. Um, and like um, Commissioner said, uh, a backup will be necessary. Yeah. Because um, if MT officers start carrying the AK-47, which is the commonest weapon that we, we use for our work, it becomes very clumsy. But there are other ways that uh, we look at it in a way that the protection that they will need to do their work will increase without necessarily giving them uh, heavy arms. Mm. Yeah, so those are the modalities that I believe from next week. Sure. Um, police management board will look at it right. and see how we can implement it. Logistics definitely are issues also to be to be concerned with. But I, I think I think that uh, we the police on duty must also exhibit some some vigilance. Uh, you sometimes when you pass around, you are in a vehicle and you pass around checkpoints, you see police officers uh, just by the roadside checking without even bothering to see what is happening around them. Uh, I have always believed or thought that uh, at various checkpoints we need to have a backup a security cover for those who are doing the examination and inspection of papers and passengers and so on. So that if there should be any move or if there should be any suspicious move, then those who are in this backup security cover will be able to, to deal with it. Um, I don't very much subscribe to arming to the teeth uh, duty men on the route. I mean, I mean uh, uh, officers from the MTU. MTU officers are just uh, checking papers. Uh, people who come around, whether they have documents on their vehicle, whether they are licensed to drive and so on. So, and the offenses associated with, uh, with, with uh, these MTU are offenses that are minor. And so you wouldn't expect them to, 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 to be, be armed with, 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 with weapons. So you have been following the discussion mm. there. We know the IGP as well as the interior minister has said that MTCD officers on duty are going to be wielding guns or weapons to mm. protect them from these attacks. 
What is your take on that? Does this attack has to happen before we think about arming MTTD officers for crying out loud, what sort of incompetence is this? Why are we so reactive to issues of security? Mm. Why are we, haven't we been proactive? Because this is not certainly the first time this is coming up. We all know what happened at La Paz when an officer was shot in, clear, in broad daylight. Yeah. Uh, we, we know some time ago around the industrial area, there was a robbery ongoing at Royal Motors. There were police officers on duty uh, at, at that particular mm -hmm. area, but they couldn't mm -hmm. confront or mm -hmm. counter the threat because they were not armed. Mm -hmm. For crying out loud, these are young men and women who put their lives on the line. They are in street corners. They are in the neighborhoods. They are in crime-infested areas. They are officers who are supposed to execute their mandate in line with the Police Service Act 350 and we don't see the need to arm them. Please, that is wrong. Mm. And I think going forward, we shouldn't constrict just the arming and the protection to those officers on special operations. Okay. Let us broaden it. Any officer on duty should be pro protected. I've spoken with lots of police officers, and trust me, if you hear the kind of tales that is coming out, how frustrated, how dampened their spirits are, with, to the extent that some are even asking if it is really worth putting up their lives on the I'm line alive. for Madagana. Unfortunately, when these things happen, we make so much noise about it, and after 72 hours really or so, we forget about it, waiting for the next officer to die, then we start talking mm -hmm. again. I remember clearly, when the police station was attacked at Kwabinya, we all saw the vice president say the police stations are going to be equipped with CCTV cameras, etc. To date, we haven't seen those CCTV cameras. Okay. Just recently, Samuel Udutok Wills uh, escaped from in cells there. in Takradi. Yeah. Nobody knows how he escaped. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Perhaps the person who aided in the escape is still working closely with the police because of the lack of surveillance systems. This is not rocket science, this is common sense. So the police management board will be meeting from next week to discuss the modalities on how to give out these weapons to the officers on duty and other areas of protection. What are your expectations? What would you suggest they inculcate into the new um, drafts that they're bringing out to govern the use of these weapons? Well, I hope um, it will not be the usual talk shop. They will not just go and drink coffee and come back home and the problems would persist. Yeah. I think that retooling is very important. However, it doesn't end there. For anyone to think that giving uh, officers guns would sort the issue must be very infantile because there are a lot more issues beyond that. I think the training regime is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to be re retrained. Uh, that is what we call in-service training because um, insecurity is changing by the day. Now we're dealing with transnational crime, highly sophisticated crime highly ongoing. Sophisticated. How do you expect the police to be at ahead of the game when they don't get these training. So that the army should come with the training. They should be trained so they are better disciplined so we don't have some of them becoming trigger happy. So if you don't pay the toll, you are shot at. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, we should uh, train them on certain operational procedures. So when you stop a non-compliant road user, he doesn't stop how to approach him should be different from a compliant road user. Mm. By being alert of the external risk that come their way as a result of the performance of their duties, I'm hoping that the casualty figures would reduce. All right. Well, also hoping, same that the casualty figures will reduce. Thank you very much. Adib Sane is a security analyst and executive director of the Jatike Center for Human Development and Peace Building. This is News at 10 on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. We're back with more after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back from the break. This is News at 10 on TV3. Now, former Minister for Energy and Petroleum, Emmanuel Amakofibwa, has won a fiercely contested primaries in the Elembele constituency. He beat his closest rival to retain his slot as parliamentary candidate for the NDC. My colleague Eric J monitored the election in that constituency. This victory, and let me thank the delegates uh, for the uh, trust reposed with me once again. Uh, to have been given this trust on the f for the fourth time uh, must tell me that uh, 
I am keeping faith with them. And so it's, it's very, very exciting. But I'm also very, uh, take the opportunity to thank them and to thank all those who made it possible. Before today's um, contest, earlier we had the information that it's going to be by popular acclamation. Then yes. it was put on hold. Were you scared? Oh, no. Actually, I think that the back and forth uh, from national created a lot of confusion. But what is important now is that we've had elections and we, uh, that the victory has been decisive. And I think that, um, let me congratulate my opponent uh, for uh, coming up. I think we are all united in one focus to basically uh, continue to consolidate power in LMBLA. What is the role that um, the aspirant going, is going to play in your campaign? Well, he's going to be very active. Uh, today I called for United NDC going forward. But when you give uh, uh, the, the candidate 91 percent mandate, it's very clear that we are united. We are going to bring everybody on board. Our focus is basically convert more MPP members and basically win power and, and basically make sure that Ellen Bele is a no-go area. I think this is a very clear message. If you saw what has happened in our primaries, the MPP did everything to influence this election. The delegates completely rejected all the enticements. Mm. And it's very clear that we are committed and our goal is to ensure that John Mahama is president 2020 and Amako Fibua continues to be the MP and oh, transform yeah, the place. Yeah, 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 we are excited. Yeah, 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 we are ready. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are ready. Okay. Thank you very much. So that is the incumbent member of parliament, Emmanuel Amako Fibua, who just won the parliamentary premise. Eric Yeweji, LMBLE, TV3 News. Still with politics, there's seeming tension within the National Democratic Congress, NDC, in the Futu constituency in the central region, as some members have petitioned leadership to pursue former NPP member Dr. James Kofi Annan to lead the party as member of parliament. The petitioners argue Dr. Annan is more competent. Dr. James Kofi Annan formed the Winneba Eskin movement in January 2019 after defecting from the NPP. The petitioners say the former NPP party member was committed to numerous developmental projects in the constituency, including training individuals in vocational skills and also given scholarships to several of them into secondary and tertiary institutions. The leader of the group, Richmond Januke, noted the NDC can only win the Efutu parliamentary seat if Dr. James Kofi Annan leads the party. We are here this morning just to make sure that the constituency executives go in for the choice of the youth and the choice of the grassroots members in the Efutu constituency. This man has been very, very lucrative when it, when it comes to giving people entrepreneurial skills, giving lending money to people to set up their own business, giving the setting up businesses for them in terms of uh, vocational, that, such as hairdressing, seamstressing, and other things. These are some of the things that our candidate, that the youth are fighting for, has done. The constituency secretary of the NDC, Abraham Arthur, in responding to the development said, the businessman is not a member of the party and had not engaged the party executives on any such matter. The party executives are not in the known of whatever is happening. Neither are we privy to whatever orchestrations that has brought all these things up. If we want to kick against it seriously, that whatever they have done is against the, the, the dictates of the constitution of the party. And that if there should be a way of going about it, I think they should use the proper channel, not this one. Reacting to the question as to whether he has intentions to join the NDC, Dr. James Kofi Annan said he wants to be the voice of the people in Parliament, but not necessarily on the ticket of NDC or NPP. I, I care about my people. The peace of my people is very important than anything else. So even if I would have to sacrifice myself, for the peace and development of my people, I'm ready. I cannot say because they will destroy my image, I will not accept their call, I will not heed to their call when they call me. Who would I send? 
and who will go. And I have told them, send me and I'll go. The NDC parliamentary primaries in Efutu and some other constituencies in the central region were put on hold due to some errors. Interesting development there and we'll see how this pans out. But time now for a break. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. The Asantehini Otum Fosei to the second has enjoined traditional leaders to bury their differences and unite for the speedy development of their communities. He said the socio-economic challenges confronting the country can best be resolved if people rally behind their leaders at all levels to proffer solutions. A report by Benjamin Edu. The Asantehini was speaking at a meeting of Asante Man Council in Kumasi to address issues confronting the kingdom and chart a new path for development. The event also coincided with the instrument of the new Barikesehini, Okofuo Amwampim Brenya, known in private life as Lawrence Amwa. The businessman succeeded Nana Kwame Ekowa the second who reigned for 59 years. The Barakese traditional area is one of the powerful states in the Ashanti Kingdom. The chieftain's seat has been vacant for the past four years due to a protracted dispute which led to retarded development of the area. The Asantehini charged the new chief to help unite all passions to drive development to Barakese. Some indigents and residents of Barikesi line the road from a Suofi to Barikesi to welcome the new chief. A resident, Reverend Charles Amwa, was happy about the instrument of the new chief. We are expecting a peaceful reign and we want the new chief to focus on development. The chief, Okofo Amwa Pembrenya, called for the support of the people for effective community development. And we wish the chief well in his new position. That's it for tonight's edition of News at 10 on TV3, which is also live on Just TV Channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Sari. Good evening.